Okay, so we're recording. Uh, Dr. Applewhite is an associate professor of surgery and bioethics and is the director of Alden March Bioethics Institute and John Ballant, um, chair of medical ethics education and research at Albany Medical College. She also serves as a consultant to the Department of Defense Medical Ethics Center at USIS. She completed her general surgery residency at Leahy Hospital and Medical Center and her endocrine surgery fellowship at the University of Chicago. She also completed a fellowship in clinical medical ethics at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago. Her research is focused on scarce resource allocation, thyroid cancer, surgical outcomes in the inmate population, and the surgeon-patient relationship. Thank you, Dr. Applewhite. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, talking about um, care for the incarcerated patient population is something that I get really excited about. And so there's a lot of information here. <laughs> um, so if we don't get through it all, forgive me. Um, and I'll try to go at a, at a pace that um, we can uh, ask questions at the end, but please feel free to interrupt me throughout if, you, if anything comes up. So I have no financial disclosures. Um, as an overview of the talk, first we'll talk about incarceration in the United States and, and what it looks like right now. Um, then I'll get into prison environment and how that affects the diseases that, that inmates acquire or how we think it does. Um, and then we'll talk about the right to refuse care, refusal of medications and um, hunger strikes is a specific issue that I also have a distinct interest in. So we'll go into that in a little bit of detail. Um, and then we'll just talk in general about the challenges with treatment and research. So um, the United States imprisons more people than any country in the world. Um, so currently there are 2.2 million people incarcerated um, in the United States, which is about the, the size of Houston. So it's a tremendous number of people. Um, there, this disproportionately favors racial and ethnic minorities. So it's a new phenomenon after the war on drugs in the 1970s and it's gradually improving. So over the last, um, a uh, few years, basically since 2006, the U.S. imprisonment rate has been on the decline. Um, it is still exponentially higher than other countries, but it is it is decreasing. Um, it is decreasing at a precip more precipitous rate in uh, the Black population, uh, but is also decreasing in the Hispanic population. Uh, but it's still, as you can see, disproportionately is represented by these minorities. So this is an interesting and, and sort of telling um, little um, uh, figure that, that shows us, you know, if you, look at the, if you look at the gold dots, this is how much of the black, white and Hispanic population is um, incarcerated. And this is the definition of incarceration that the, the Pew Research Center uses is at least one year um, in prison. The, the white dots are their percentage in the United States population, right? So you see if, if black people, particularly black men, make up 12% of the US adult population, they are 33% of the US prison population. So although their numbers are declining precipitously over the, since 2006, um, and, and it is still a significant proportion as related to their representation um, in the general census. Um, and you can see those, those numbers as they compare to the white and Hispanic populations as well. So everything that we're gonna talk about here going forward, um, we'll talk about um, you know, increased susceptibilities to different diseases. We will talk about um, ability to refuse care and how rights change when you enter a prison. Um, disproportionately affects minorities, which, which is, is sort of an underlying um, uh, theme that we will recognize. So this is a big population of people, 2.2 million, and it's, it's, it's getting older, right? So the mandatory minimum sentences that were imposed in the war on drugs um, means that an aging population uh, is, is happening in prisons. Between 1992 and 2012, the prevalence of incarcerated persons 55 or older increased by 550%. So they're known to have statistically higher rates of certain medical problems, uh, people who are incarcerated when they're compared to the general population. So they are known to have higher rates of HIV, hepatitis C, tuberculosis, mental illness, and previous traumatic brain injury. But now they're developing the new problems that people just get as they age, right? So you're more likely to develop diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and any other number of things, including cancer, right? Complex medical and surgical problems develop over time um, in, this, in this giant population of people. So we are seeing people 
in hospitals coming in shackled to the bed more and more frequently as this aging population is getting sicker and sicker. And the question really is, how are we taking care of these people? And, and are we giving them the standard of care that we give our other patients? And is that even, is that even possible given the implicit bias that's rampant within hospitals? So looking specifically at prison environment and disease, um, there are anecdotal issues. So at, at Albany Med, we take care of a lot of, um, we take care of a lot of inmates. We have a contract with the New York State Department of Corrections. And so uh, the number of inmates that we get is significant. We go to prison clinics, we go to the maximum security prison locally, and we take care of all of the surrounding medium and maximum security uh, prisoners who have surgical problems. So anecdotally, we have observed these patients experience significant delays in care. Um, when I wanna schedule an, uh, uh, someone from the general population for a thyroidectomy, I simply see them in the clinic, I walk them to my scheduler and I say, book them for my next available, right? When I am seeing an inmate, I see them in my clinic, I then say to the, um, the COs that are with them, here's what I recommend, please give this to your schedulers at the facility. They take it to the facility, they go to the infirmary, they give my recommendations. My recommendations are then given from the infirmary staff to the physician there. The physician there decides whether or not that's an appropriate sort of course of action for the inmate. And at that point, the schedulers there talk to my schedulers and they book it an indeterminate period of time out in order to facilitate any number of you know, structural and regulatory um, issues that they have to go through, not only with transportation, but with regard to safety and timing with other inmates. Um, and then they get booked. So the average time that I that an inmate will wait to have the same surgery as someone from the general population, from my anecdotal experience, is about a month or two longer. So they have delays in care from that perspective. Um, the other interesting part is that they don't know when they're having surgery. We are strictly told not to tell the inmates about any of their upcoming tests operations or appointments, because if they know the timing of it, the concern is that it will be a safety issue um, in and around the, their transportation. Um, so what happens on the day of surgery is they get woken up at like four in the morning and told to get in the van, today's the day, right? And then they're driven. Um, and they all go in at the same time because transportation, so you can have your operation at 3 p.m. and you're going at the same time as somebody who has their operation at 7 a.m. because they all come together and get put in what's called the bullpen downstairs where they, where they wait for their time, basically. And they don't know until that very moment they're having surgery that day. Um, so other anecdotal issues aside from delays in care are um, that their chronic medical conditions are, are poorly controlled, um, that physicians are generally unaware and unequipped, uh, especially in hospital, for managing not only what they've come in for, but their increased TBI, their increased mental illness, um, increased history of sexual abuse and other comorbidities. So this presents limitations in care from that one perspective. Once they get into the hospital, um, we see that with the corrections officers that are present, uh, you know, you're talking about sensitive things with patients and it's, a, it's, it's questionably sort of a HIPAA violation, right? You're talking about very sensitive issues and, and you have other people present who are not necessarily selected by the inmates to be there, but who need to be there for safety issues. Um, they're shackled um, any time that they're awake. Uh, we have to explicitly ask the uh, COs in the room to take the shackles off after they're under a general anesthetic. Um, they have limited mobility. Um, if they're on the locked floor, um, which we have, a, we have a, a locked unit, they can walk around without their shackles on. But if they're not in the locked unit and they're on a general population floor, if they wanna walk post-operatively, they need to have their shackles on and be accompanied by a CO, which um, many of them are not as, as enthusiastic to do, right? Because it, it, it attracts attention that is unwanted and inappropriate. Um, they are almost five times more likely to have a venous thromboembolic vent after surgery. And there are limited or in many cases, absent visitation um, uh, rules for these, these individuals. Um, in the absence of end of life uh, sort of visitation, they really don't have anyone that we can even talk to after surgery is done. They have no support at the bedside to, to get them mobilized, to sort of ground them, to advocate for them if they're not, you know, getting something that, that a family member otherwise would think that they would need. And interestingly, there are no surgical outcome studies discussing inmates. So 
Um, they're not included in the national databases, including the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project, the National Cancer Database, and the uh, National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. So it's, it's, um, it's really hard to know what operations they have, really what medical problems they have in general, um, how well they do after surgery, what troubles they do have if we keep them under anesthetic longer than other patients, or if we um, are more likely to give them a general anesthetic than a local anesthetic and a MAC. And so sort of how does their care differ? We don't know because we don't have those data. So um, looking at the HCUP, this is called the nation's most comprehensive source of hospital care data. There are no inmates. Looking at the National Cancer Database, this data represents more than 70% of, of cancer cases nationwide. There are no inmates included in this. We have no idea what kinds of cancers they get. If you look at NISQIP, um, this is the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. So the idea of this database is to measure and improve the quality of surgical care. So there are, na there are national standards of what is quality care. Um, Inmates aren't included at this database, so we don't know if we administer uh, equitable care to them. So there's a lack of information on these individuals. Medical problems of the inmates are poorly documented. The infirmary data are not public. And even with an IRB for protocol, data can be nearly impossible to obtain. Um, all we know is that from a Bureau of Justice Statistics um, survey in 2004 is that about 12% of inmates have surgery while they're incarcerated and there was no other information regarding what the diagnosis was and what their outcomes were. So we foresee them having unique problems um, as, composed to, as compared to the general population. So they live in a relatively hostile environment um, that can lead to hypervigilance and PTSD. In animal models with PTSD, there's a state of immune modulation. So actually having chronic stressors in a hypervigilant state can result in pro-inflammatory cytokines and um, a general state of sort of a hyped up immune system. So we know that PTSD is more prevalent in inmates. So in a systematic review and a meta-analysis using 22,000 imprisoned men and women around the world, uh, it was found that the lifetime prevalence of PTSD in inmates is 18% for men and 40% for women. This is compared to the lifetime prevalence of PTSD in the general population, and this was uh, looked at in Western countries, which is 5% for men and 10.4% for women. So women who are, or men who are incarcerated have a greater than threefold higher prevalence of PTSD, and women who are incarcerated have a greater than fourfold higher prevalence of PTSD than those who are not in incarcerated. So this is a study that was done um, in, in veterans um, of Iraq and Af Afghanistan. Um, and what they found was that those who had a pro-inflammatory milieu were disposed to autoimmune diseases. And so veterans with PTSD are found to have an increased incidence of autoimmune diseases across the board, thyroiditis, inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, um, and they also have an increased risk of coronary artery disease. Military sexual trauma exposure was independently associated with an increased risk in both men and women. So should these patients be treated differently or sooner? So what we know so far is that PTSD, as it's been studied in the military field, demonstrates an increased risk of medical problems, autoimmune problems specifically. And I can tell you that anecdotally taking care of a lot of patients with Graves disease, which is an autoimmune thyroid disease, um, in the inmate population, their Graves disease is symptomatically and biochemically much more severe than the general population. Um, and we are in the process of doing an outcome study on that now, but again, getting those data is so hard. Um, but the men, that, the men that we take care of with Graves disease from the, um, from the facilities that we service have 50 pound weight loss over two or three months. They have tremors that you can see when you're sitting there and talking to them, their eyes bulge significantly. And when you see individuals of that same age group in the general population, their disease is far less biochemically severe and they complain of far fewer symptoms. And so there must be something to the hypervigilant environment within the Department of Corrections, within the prisons um, that leads to exacerbation of these autoimmune conditions. And, and the, the military literature would, would support that with regard to PTSD. 
So here we'll sort of transition a little bit to talk about, um, uh, I guess, human rights in prisons. So um, when you look at uh, a prison, you think they're going to live here and, and you find very quickly that this is not just another place to live. So normally you can choose what food you want, right? You can choose what to do with your spare time. You can choose where you go and how you get there. Um, as in general population, you choose your hobbies, you choose when you sleep and where you sleep, um, who you hang out with, what you wear, um, when you can exercise. Um, but, but it's a totally different environment when many rights are taken away. So uh, individuals that are told, told what they need to wear, where they need to be and when, and what they eat. The one right that they do maintain is the right to bodily integrity. So what happens when they refuse care? Um, and are they allowed to refuse care? So a free person has the right to refuse medical treatment even when it is necessary to save their own life. The 14th Amendment protects a liberty interest in prisoners not being treated against their will. And it says that a competent person has a constitutional protected liberty interest in refusing unwanted medical treatment. However, the inmate's right to refuse care is different from the general population. So if they have any number of communicable diseases, if they have um, a mental illness that might put the other um, uh, inmates at risk, they have tuberculosis. In the general population, you could elect not to be treated for these things. You could just not go to the doctor, right? Um, but when the health, when the safety and the security and the health of the other prisoners uh, is potentially affected by your medical problem, it is required that you are treated, right? So they may also be forced to accept treatment that is necessary to protect their health from permanent injury. So to protect the health of those around them and to protect their own health. So it is, it is subtly different, the right to refuse care. So there's a famous um, court case, Washington v. Harper in 1990, uh, that ultimately determined that a physician can treat over objection if the patient has a mental disorder and is gravely disabled by this mental disorder, or if they pose a risk of serious harm. And it was actually ultimately decided that expert decision in this situation, meaning an outside um, psychiatrist, the infirmary doctors, and a series of other people um, could get together around a table and decide, yes, this person is gravely disabled from their mental disorder. They do pose a risk of serious harm to those around them or to themselves. So that satisfies the right to due process. Um, so we um, talked about this. Um, they do have to undergo an appropriate hearing. They have to be evaluated by a non-treating psychiatrist, by a psychologist, as well as the asso associate superintendent of the prison. They require periodic reviews. And um, oh, before we get to hunger strikes, the, the, sort of the Washington v. Harper is predicated on um, the, the situation that Harper was refusing his medications for his mental illness. Um, as such, he was in solitary confinement for an extended period of time because he was very dangerous to those around him. Uh, they, they feared for the safety and security of the other inmates. So he was refusing his medications and was put in solitary confinement such that at one point they determined that the um, that his own well-being, his own psychological well-being was being compromised. And so they wanted to be able to incorporate him back into the community and they could only do that, uh, they felt safely if they forced, forced to deliver these medications. Um, so to talk about hunger strikes, um, what is a hunger strike? So a hunger strike is a voluntary total fasting, taking only water uh, for 48 to 72 hours as a means of protest. Um, and the question, so I started writing a paper with um, the New York State Department of Corrections uh, Deputy Commissioner, and he's very interested in hunger strikes from the perspective of um, why, why do inmates strike? And if this is an issue of human rights to be able to strike, um, why do we force feed people, right, um, from occasion, uh, on occasion rather, in, um, in prison? So, um, he did sort of an informal poll of why do inmates strike? He talked to all the individuals at the, um, at the infirmaries in his maximum medium security prisons and basically determined that it's a bargaining tool. So they wanna gain protective custody. They wanna maybe regain commissary privileges that have been lost. 
they don't like the cell block that they're living in. So they want to, they want to change cells. Um, they only want to eat food that is delivered by their family. They don't want to eat the food that they've been told they need to eat. Uh, maybe they want to be moved to a prison closer to their family. And so maybe they want to leave solitary confinement. So they, they sort of say, I'm not going to eat until you give me what I want, right? And, and sort of anecdotally from his brief surveys, these are the reasons why um, inmates uh, went on uh, hunger strikes. So who can decide to go on hunger strike? Can you decide to go on a hunger strike? Can a celebrity decide to go on a hunger strike? Can my four-year-old son de decide to go on a hunger strike? Can an inmate decide to go on a hunger strike, right? The answer to the first two questions are sure, right? You can go on a hunger strike. Um, LeBron James can go on a hunger strike. My four-year-old son can't because I don't think he has the, the willpower, but he could theoretically if he if he gains some willpower. Um, but an in, in inmate uh, can't go on a hunger strike for an extended period of time. And we're gonna talk about what that looks like. So what happens when an inmate goes on a hunger strike? So phase one, this is in the first few days, okay? The metabolic response um, is that the body uses up the glucose and um, it goes to the brain only, right? It favors the brain. Physically, um, that person will become irritable and impulsive, hyperactive and become very thirsty. So the response of the prison team is to do routine physical and mental health exams. They check on them daily and for at least in New York State Department of Corrections, they have a very clear protocol of uh, the, the questions that they ask, the vitals that they take, um, and, and sort of uh, an overall trajectory of how the patient is doing throughout the strike. Um, and they counsel them about the physical effects of starvation. So phase two. So let's say that phase one has passed. They continue to strike because they haven't gotten what they wanted or they've not decided to begin eating. Um, their metabolic response is that their fats are metabolized into ketone bodies. And physically this looks like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. They get abdominal pain and confusion and weakness that leads to an inability to sense thirst. So even if they had been taking in water, at this point they have sort of a compromised sense of the, uh, the drive for thirst, uh, which is problematic. The prison response is ongoing physical and mental health evaluations blood tests, EKGs, and when they're clinically declining, uh, they begin thinking about escalating care. So it sort of stops from being daily or twice daily rounds to check on the patient um, into maybe they should go to the RMU and talk about accepting fluids if they would be interested in it. Phase three is much longer and it's very unusual for them to get this far. Um, but the metabolic response is that protein and muscle um, is consumed um, and cellular function declines. Um, they begin having seizures, loss of consciousness, susceptibility to infections and cardiac arrhythmias. And the prison response at this point is to, consideration for to consider force feeding due to imminent risk of permanent damage. So when involuntary treatment is considered is when they see evidence of end organ damage and they can tell this by physical exam and by their laboratory values. Um, when an inmate has a pre-existing comorbidity that may hasten permanent harm or when there's a long, prolonged hunger strike greater than 21 days. When the patient is reaching less than 85% of their ideal body weight or when they've had a significant decline in their body mass index such that it becomes concerning uh, for permanent harm. So as a quick look of what does, what does involuntary feeding look like? So initially you can give saline, right? You can, if they'll allow it, give, you can put in an IV and, and just give them some fluid. And this is when they lose their drive for thirst and, um, and you wanna just you know, give them a little bit of volume. You can include any number of electrolytes that they may need based on the labs that you draw if they allow you to draw labs. Ultimately, you can give them TPN, um, which includes uh, the need for a central line, um, or you can give PPN peripherally, which does not provide uh, as, as good of, um, uh, as high quality of delivery of um, the, the um, electrolytes and the lipids, um, but you can give it peripherally as well, which is a, 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 an easier line to put in certainly. And ultimately it requires a feeding tube. So you can give TPN for a short period of time, but at some point their livers are going to suffer for getting uh, TPN for too long. And so you, you think about feeding with um, a tube. So um, the temporary tubes that we can put in are nasogastric tubes. And um, 
Uh, the food can be infused over the food, the, the, the feeds can be infused over a period of time. And um, when this is done in the force feeding realm, they're usually strapped into a chair. And um, this is done for a couple of hours a day. They basically put it in an NG tube um, under duress frequently. They're, um, the nurses suffer, have anecdotally suffered injuries of bites and uh, scratches, and it, it can be violent, as you might imagine, for someone who doesn't want to have a tube put down, even if you are sick and you need a tube in the hospital and you're not an inmate and this is going to make you better, it is really uncomfortable to have a nasogastric tube placed. Super uncomfortable. So for someone who's totally uninterested in this process at all, um, you can recognize how it's not a pleasant situation and people can become hurt. So um, you ultimately, you know, the, these people are um, fed over a series of hours. Um, as frequently as needed until they decide to start eating. And then ultimately, um, if even after being refed, they refuse food, you think about putting in a permanent feeding tube, like a, a, a gastric tube or a gastro jejunal tube, um, so that they would not need to have an NG tube placed every single day, uh, but rather would have, you know, port um, just directly to their stomach. And for the, this is more for the, for the non-physicians, um, but you know, to, to see that this is effectively what a, a gastric tube looks like. It just goes directly through the skin and into the stomach. You blow up a little balloon on the other side of the stomach. And then through that tube, you've, you put in tube feeds and it sort of gets capped off the rest of the day. So as you can see, so this is um, uh, put on 2017. This is sort of the average length of hunger strikes. I think this was a, a study done in South Carolina on, on their hunger strikes or something like this. So the, the, the number of people who ultimately would require even tube feeds, much less tube feeds through a permanent feeding tube is really, really low. Almost all hunger strikes last only a few days or a week. Um, but when it does get to those sort of advanced stages, and people come to the hospital, it's not always easy to find a surgeon who's willing to put in a gastric tube in a patient who will not give consent. Um, you also have to find an anesthesiologist who's willing to anesthetize a patient who's not giving consent. Um, so the number of obstacles uh, that individuals face um, while trying to feed force feed people and you know in hunger strikes are um, are many. So Dr. the question. Applewhite. Yeah. Hi, this is Lieutenant Commander Suhako. I'm just Hi. I have a question about, um, so you place a gastric tube. How yep. often does the prisoner just pull it out? The G, the G tube? Yeah. The G tube. Yeah. They have to be restrained, right? The so, whole time. And is that, yeah. You're right. Yeah. Because it's easy to, it's, um, it's not easy to pull out, right? It's sewn in, but um, it's easy to pull out, right? Like if, if that is what you want to do. And it's, it's a, it's a similar sort of phenomenon as with, um, people with dementia who have G tubes, you know, and it's similar, but different, right? You know, if something is there that you don't want there, that's foreign to you. Yeah. I mean, it can be pulled out. So then at that point you have to talk about restraining a patient who's wide awake. Good question. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the question arises is, is it unethical to feed an adult with capacity over objection? Um, many say it is. So in the Declaration of Malta in 1991, um, it was determined that it is ethical to allow a determined hunger striker to die with dignity rather than submit that person to repeated interventions against his or her will. And that forcible feeding is never ethically acceptable, even if it is intended to benefit. Um, feeding is accompanied by threats, coercion, force, or use of physical restraints as a form of inhuman and degrading treatment. In the World Medical Association Declaration of Tokyo, um, they determined that where a prisoner refuses nourishment and is considered by the physician as being capable of forming an unimpaired and rational judgment concerning the consequences of the voluntary refusal of nourishment, he or she shall not be fed artificially. The Red Cross put out a statement in 2013 that said that um, they are opposed to force feeding or forced treatment because it is essential that the detainees' choices be respected and that their human dignity be preserved. So their position on the issue closely corresponds to that that we just reviewed in the Declaration of Malta and Tokyo. But others say that it's not unethical, right? So the New York State um, Department of Corrections vision and mission is um, to enhance public safety by having incarcerated persons return home under supportive supervision. Um, and in their mission statement, they say that they, you know, 
They provide a continuity of appropriate treatment and services in safe and secure facilities where all inmates' needs are addressed and they're prepared for release. In the Connecticut Supreme Court in 2012, um, Commissioner versus Coleman, the state's interest in a prisoner's health and safety of the institution outweighs the prisoner's common law right to bodily integrity. So this is a really big deal, right? The state's interests in that prisoner's health, so effectively what we just saw that they're in safe and secure facilities where all their needs are addressed and they're under supportive supervision, outweighs the prisoner's common law right to bodily integrity. Uh, it was said explicitly that this does not violate the prisoner's first and 14th amendment rights to free speech and privacy, and um, that the weight of international authority does not prohibit medically ne necessary force feeding. There were similar rulings by the New York Court um, State of Appeals, the Seventh District Court, uh, the U.S. District Judge of California, and um, the State of Utah after there was a death of a starved inmate. Um, the Federal Bureau of Prisons policy is not to delay feeding if it's an immediate threat to life or if there's possible permanent damage to their health. And a hunger strike was effectively um, equated to a suicidal act. So from, from the perspective of, of the physician or the nurses or anyone helping to take care of these patients within the facility, um, if you can imagine, I got a lot of pushback when I talked about hunger strikes at the, the national ethics meeting because I sort of gave, you know, I just think it's a lot more complicated than it, than it necessarily presents itself to be in the Declaration of Malta in Tokyo. Because if you are the physician or the nurse or the part of the team who's rounding every day on these people and you see them becoming incre incrementally sicker and sicker and sicker, you're effectively watching someone die and allowing it to happen. And that's so foreign to people who take care of patients. Um, and, you know, there, there, there's a saying that is if, if someone tells you that they have a rope and that at some point they're going to put it around their neck and they're going to hang themselves, would you still let them keep that rope, right? So if this, if there is someone saying, I'm going to stop eating and I'm never going to eat again, would you just allow them to die? And, and I'm not saying that people don't deserve to have the right to bodily integrity and to make their own decisions when they have capacity. But I'm just saying it's a lot harder, I think, um, when you're on the ground level and you're dealing with a patient who is, who is suffering. Um, and although we don't have, have real data on why individuals go on hunger strikes in prisons, um, you know, it's hard to think about um, allowing someone to die in exchange for not having their commissary privileges, um, even if that decision is made with capacity. Um, so it's, it's I, think, I think there's more to it than meets the eye. And I could, I could argue either side, I guess. So um, the 1976 Supreme Court case, Estelle v. Gamble, um, determined that deliberate indifference to serious medical needs of prisoners constitutes cruel and unusual punishment by the Eighth Amendment. So this is sort of taking a step back to not having any data on inmates, not being able to easily study their outcomes. And so to say without any data and without any outcomes data, does this not constitute an indifference to this population? So are we not, are we not sort of violating their Eighth Amendment right um, uh, because we don't know anything about them and because we aren't tailoring care to them and understanding uh, what medical problems they have and, and um, and how their outcomes are. And we're not necessarily able to guarantee that they have equitable care to those who are around them um, in the general public. So in conclusion, um, the care of inmates is challenging for clinical and ethical reasons. The rights to refuse care are not equal between the general population and inmates in all cases um, due to safety concerns. And this vulnerable patient population is made more vulnerable because they're technically difficult to study uh, and thus understand. So I will take any questions. Uh, my children will be too weak to hunger strike with their love for um, ice cream. <laughs> uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Pingati. Uh, I have a question about uh, when you were talking about their possibility to refuse care. Uh, yep. How does that differ when you're talking from a, a psych standpoint, how does that differ for the inmates as opposed to the general psych population? Especially when um, they can, you can get a court order, which, you know, 
it sure takes longer, but get a court order to bring somebody in to get their psych shots and things like that. Is it just that it's faster to do it for the inmate population or, or is there something different? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think I think in the general population, people are able to disappear, right? And in 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 the prisons, they're just not. The they have a very close eye on all of the inmates at all times, um, and I, I would I would think that the sort of the reason um, of the state's interest to um, sort of give the psychiatric medications to uh, inmates who refuse them or inmates whose uh, mental health uh, will affect the um, well-being of themselves and those around them is is really more for for security and safety and so it's kind of thinking about why we're giving the medications whereas in the general public certainly there are people who if they don't take their mental health medications they can be dangerous um, but I think that it's so much more of an intimate setting within the prison population and they they have a closer eye on everybody that's just more likely to happen sooner because people can't can't sort of just decide not to take it and stay home and not leave their house but I think it is as you put out, it's it's mostly um, because it's quicker and because you have a closer eye on people. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Has anybody had any experiences with any of these things that they would feel comfortable sharing? Dr. Applewhite, this is Captain Kane. Um, I have a... Uh, uh, philosophical question for you. Uh, I studied in the World Health Organization when I was over in the UK, and one of the things that I think the World Health Organization uh, wrestles with is you have this uh, enormous uh, um, migration of refugees across the world um, from war-torn countries, and some of the hunger strikes that are, are happening uh, uh, mm -hmm. are from these uh, countries that are in severe conflict and then these you've got this population of people trying to seek asylum into safe harbor countries. So my question is, do you draw a philosophical difference between those within the prison situation that you described versus a political prisoner, number one, such as what the uh, U.S. has experienced down in Gitmo with our political mm -hmm. prisoners, as well as, you know, we have a lot of countries West wrestle with this. Palestinian in 2012 had a huge, um, excuse me, uh, Israel had a huge hunger strike with the Palestinian prisoners, yep. as well as Iran just recently had an enormous hunger strike within their um, population uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, remember the Egyptian um, prisoner, the American prisoner being held in Egypt, he went on a hunger strike and he died. And he was being held as a political prisoner. Do you feel like there is a difference? That's a really good question. So, <laughs> you know, it, so much of it, um, so much of it depends on whether or not you care why people are striking, right? And whether or not you think your perception of their reason is good enough, right? So I could easily say, well, if someone is um, is striking because their family is being, you know, separated from them and their children are growing up as orphans and they want their family back, is that a better reason to go on a hunger strike as compared to, um, you know, wanting to go to the next cell block over just because that's where your friends are? And does what I think about your reason matter? You know, should should I be allowed to determine whether or not that's an adequate reason? So I'd say, if you talk to a true philosopher, the reason shouldn't matter. The reason, the 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 ability to hunger strike should be the ability to hunger strike, regardless of of the intended reason. No, I think it's a great point to bring up is because we do have political prisoners across the world. You know, it, it doesn't make a difference knowing that that political prisoner wants to. It is maybe against American philosophy or against an Israeli philosophy or against an Iranian philosophy. Uh, you know, does that make a difference? Right. I mean, I would get so, I would get destroyed by a real philosopher right now, but I would say it does make a difference. You know, I would want to say that, you know, if, if I'm a political prisoner, I, I am entitled to die for what I believe. Right. Um, so is it, is dying for what you believe different than dying for what you want for a bargaining chip? And, and 
I would get destroyed by the philosophers in my department. They're just on the other side of that door, you know, that I, for, for trying to, de- for trying to, to declare that I can, I can possibly know someone's true motivations and how important those motivations are to them. Uh, but yeah, my reflex is to say, yeah, you should be allowed to die for what you believe. Right. Um, yeah. What do you think? I, I'm, I am in the same wheelhouse as you, uh, that if you do want to die for your political be- belief, and uh, then, you know, you have the right to do that. Yeah. What else? Does anybody else have any questions or do you want to you fight about something? Do you like disagree with anything that I said? <laughs> I like a good intellectual banter. <laughs> Uh, I would like to share uh, one thing. Uh, so I actually, before the Navy, uh, I was a tech at Albany Med in the ER. Hey, so awesome. I, yeah, so I would see all of the inmates that would come through. Yeah. Uh, and so looking at um, the nurses that would care for the inmates, uh, it would be interesting to see their philosophy on how they were going to provide care for that person. Mm-hmm. Uh, there would be uh, nurses who would refuse to do it. Uh, and give the patient to somebody else. There were nurses who would provide care to that person just like they would a family member. And then there were nurses who uh, would look up what crime the person had committed to see what they thought, uh, how responsive they were going to be um, to the person. So uh, I think that it's uh, a very interesting aspect when you're able to sit and watch people around you and, and what they do and how they how they choose their actions. Isn't that interesting? And that is, it is, that is such a valuable perspective to have been able to, to acquire. A couple of medical students last year gathered a bunch of data from the ED um, on long bone fractures. And they basically compared narcotic administration or pain medication, pain control um, given to the inmates with long bone fractures versus non-inmates with long bone fractures what type of medication they got, how long it took them to get that medication, how frequently anyone asked if they were in pain um, and compared the two groups. And, you know, it would, it, it should be of no surprise to anyone that those were dramatically different. Um, you know, I, I operated on an inmate who actually wasn't an inmate anymore. So he, he was incarcerated when I first saw him and then he was released and now he's sort of a ward of the state, um, but because he's, he's not mentally well. And so it's sort of like, and you know, he has no one to help take care of him. Um, but so he still he still travels with uh, guards, although they're not armed anymore. Um, but when he came into the preoperative area, um, I was told what he did, and I had literally no interest in knowing that. And I am emphatic about those around me also not knowing that. Um, and it is impossible, given some of the nature of these crimes, to not let that permeate your brain, right? Um, And I was so angry. I was so angry that I knew that because not only should it not matter, but he's already been punished for his crime, right? Like this is double jeopardy. He's effectively being tried twice for the same crime in a sense, right? He not only was he punished because of his crime and he went to prison and he served his time and he has been released, but now somehow the the care that he's gonna get is gonna be somehow altered because everyone in the preoperative area was aware of the crime that he committed. So it is, as you say, I think looking up, even though it is public, publicly available data, um, the crimes of these individuals, I think is a, I think it's a moral crime. <laughs> what else? Good morning, Captain Polyar here. Yeah, I experienced something um, similar to Louis, but on a on a single scale. I had a patient who had apparently he hadn't been accused of having um, committed a crime to another police officer, but he was in the hospital with a chest tube and he had also been beat up. <clears throat> and like for 48 hours, he hadn't had any pain medication. Um, and when I received him, the nurse told me that he was a really easy patient and that he hadn't had pain all day. And like when I started taking care of the patient, um, He's like, I've been in pain all day and I don't know why any of these people won't give me pain medicine and why they're treating me so bad. And um, the police officer obviously was in the room, another one, like probably a, um, one of the ones that had been injured, like a, a colleague. And so I felt like there was a lot of pressure maybe on the nurses too. But of course I took care of him and gave him pain medicine at the end of the shift, he felt a lot better. 
but it, I really struggled with that, that he hadn't had any pain med medication for about 48 hours, at least going back through all the charting. It really bothered me. It's horrible. It, it's so hard in the conflict, the conflict that arises when you have when you have other police officers in the room, potentially those who were involved, right? It becomes an unsafe environment, not only for the patient, but, but potentially for the staff too. It's because they're, it's charged. I haven't looked at the, at the comments at all. If there's a comment, a question in the comments that anybody thinks that we should talk about, just uh, please offer it up. I'm happy to talk about it. So, ma'am, in, in regards to some of the rulings where the uh, the courts have gone over the uh, some of the objections and some of those uh, those protocols, you're talking about like the Tokyo one and the, the WHO, is kind of like the ruling, kind of like how the uh, how the schools have like in loco parentis because they become wards of the state because we've incarcerated and we've taken their uh, and and so the state has taken upon themselves basically to, to care for them. Is that kind of like the understanding of why that they are no longer allowed to basically have some of that autonomy in those in those situations? Right, effectively because there's there's if there's ever a fear for safety or security, and that the state has effectively assumed that right to provide those things for those individuals. Uh, you're exactly right. That's exactly um, the reason that is cited for sort of overstepping Tokyo and Malta and, and WHO. Good question. Anybody else have anything else? Thank you so much for having me. It was, um, uh, it was a pleasure and I really appreciate you guys participating. And, and if any of you guys wanna uh, talk about this further or anything else, I'm happy to. Thank you, Dr. Applewhite for coming. Typically when we have guest speakers in person, we can uh, provide them a coin um, as a symbol of our uh, appreciation for for your uh, service. Thank you so much. And we'll be sending that to you in the mail. Oh, thank you so much. That's, that's really very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Applewhite. All right, my pleasure. It was really nice to talk to you guys and, um, and certainly reach out if, if you ever need anything or if you want to collaborate or if you have any questions. All right, take care. Thank you, bye-bye. Everyone, bye. please take a, a 10 minute break. And when you come back at 11, we'll have our next guest speaker.